Welcome to our Torah Anytime viewers. We are in Parshas Masai. We are during the three weeks and we are during one of the most trying times that have been in Eretz Israel since its inception. We know that we're in the middle of a big war here. We know that we don't know what's going to be tomorrow, Mayeled Yom, as the expression goes. <coughs> we're hitting prime people at the same time as they're trying to attack us missile after missile after missile. So I decided a perfect subject to discuss on this subject is in this week's Parsha, and Parsha's Masai, and like I said, it has to do with everything to do with the Chorim Beis Amikdash. Over here, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, Dabeo B'nei Yisrael V'omart Aleim, when you go into the yard and you cross to Eretz Canaan, what does it say that you should do? V'arashtem et ta'aretz v'yishavtem ba kilechem natati ta'aretz l'reshet v'ta. I want you to go into the land and conquer it and, and, and dwell inside of the land. We want you to be in Israel. V'yichaltem et ta'aretz b'goral l'mishpachotayim. And you should go ahead and give the nachla over to everyone. It says over here the importance of going and moving to Eretz Israel to be able to get there. Now, is this a mitzvah or not? The truth is the Ramban here is of the Shittah very, very much, and he says this in many, many places. But especially here, the Ramban emphasizes the fact that there is a mitzvah, the Araita, to be living in Eretz Israel. In his Sefer's mitzvahs of his book of the mitzvot, of the things that the Rambam left out, one of the mitzvot that he brings is that there is a mitzvah, what we call Yeshiva Aretz, moving to Eretz Israel. Ramban writes about this in a very passionate way in many, many places. And he says the main places from our Parsha, Parsha Masai. Because over here it says the importance of going into the land, dwelling in the land, staying there and inheriting it. He calls, he says it's a tzivoy. This is unlike Rashi that says it's a promise. According to Rashi, the simple understanding is based on the fact that it's a promise. That Akash Baruch is telling us that I'm going to take you into Eretz Israel and you're going to be okay. And the truth is, the Rambam does not bring this mitzvah, the 613 mitzvot. He doesn't bring it. And there are many different mefarshim. Some people want to say that Shadon the Rambam is only until uh, the Galut, until we finish, and once we were thrown out of the land, that's it. Now there's not a mitzvah to come back until we come back. There's no mitzvah of coming back. That's how the Megillah Esther uh, brings, uh, brings a period here. The Peat HaShulchan says that he asks on that. He says, what do you mean? We find many places even nowadays, that there are many halachot that have to do with Eretz Yisrael, and that there's a mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. For instance, the halacha is you're allowed to tell a goy to sign a contract to live in Eretz Yisrael. I'm not talking about those investors that like to buy 15 apartments here. I'm talking about someone who wants to buy and buy one apartment here in Eretz Yisrael in order to move. Sign a contract. You can tell a goy even on Shabbat to go ahead and do it because it's a mitzvah of Eretz Yisrael to tell him to do such a thing. The famous halacha. It's brought down the Shulchan Aruch. It's a Gemara in Git and Davchet. We know that the halacha is that if a woman does not want to go into Eretz Yisrael and the husband does, or the other way around, a husband does not and the woman does, or if they're leaving in Eretz Yisrael and one wants to leave, one doesn't, you're allowed to give the person the get and with exuber, with without exuber, depending on who the person is. They are entitled. A person who wants to live in Eretz Yisrael has the upper hand. There's also a mitzvah of living in Eretz Yisrael. And there's also an isra of leaving Eretz Yisrael. There are many different places where these things are brought, the halacha. And that's what the Ramban brings by us, that there are all these special ideas of living in Eretz Yisrael. And he says this with these words, says the Ramban, V'im yalu, yalel datchem lalechet v'lichosh it's not only... Is there a mitzvah to move? But he says, if you ever want to move and conquer a land, and he says, Shinar or Ashur, if you want to go and conquer some other land besides Eretz Israel, he happens to, he for, happened to forgot at one place, Uganda, like Herzl wanted to go ahead and move to Uganda, no problem. If that's it is, you're over in Isser, Bittel, Mitzvah to say, the mitzvah is to come here. If you ever go and conquer the land, if the Jews decide to conquer the land, and this is the place. Baruch Hashem, it worked out well that they decided not to go to North Africa, they decided to move over here. Bokopanim, that's the special mitzvah that he that he says here, and there's a mitzvah on a on a constant basis to be able to do it. Like I said, the Rambam doesn't bring it for specific reasons, but there is at least, according to the Rambam, used to be a mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael, or maybe it could be that he holds this pasuk is a haftacha, a promise, such as what Rashi says, but not necessarily a tzivui, a command. On Kopanim, we see the importance of coming here. Now I want to point out something extremely important here, which this is what we want to address is how do you have to conquer this land, the how, and is it worth it? We know that we live in a time that's very difficult. To live here in Eretz Yisrael, no, it's not simple. And I deal many times with people who are making Aliyah on a constant basis, and their question is always, should I make the move or not make the move? Different people as different or about him. <coughs> and is it a di place that's dangerous? And this is what we're going to address. 
But here we have it in our Pasuk, it says, How do you do this? The way to live in this land is to drive out anybody that's in here. When you're doing it, you better do it out of sof. And listen to those words. Now, literally speaking, means you should destroy the Ravodazara, the things that they make. But listen to the words. Maskiotam is the same legend as a musk. A musk. Get rid of the musks. When you make the when you make the move, when you come in, you want to take over, then go ahead and take over. Don't do any have jobs. If you're gonna do it, get rid of the musks, get rid of the Avodazara, get rid of the any goyim that are in here, and do if you're gonna do the job, do it ad asof. Says Rashi. What does it mean when it says to get rid of maskiotam? He says the bait of the bait, the the houses of worship. You should drive them out. The places that they they're busy doing things. Says Rashi, "Ve'ol rashtem etaretz, ve'ol rashtem otam yisrael." Get rid of all the dwellers inside the land, and then ve'yishaftim ba. And then you could sit on it. You'll you'll be able to live there. But if you don't, if you decide to leave them in here for whatever reason, so then you should know you're not going to be mitkayemba. You're not going to be the one that's going to be able to live here. Unbelievable nevua from Rashi based on Chazal, obviously, that says the only way that we'll be able to survive in this land is one and only by doing the job and doing it at a sof. We come into this land, we pick only Eretz Israel, we don't pick anywhere else, and we do it in order to live here uh, without uh, without anybody else to, to be stepping on our shoes. That's the way it is. Imlav loituchal nizkayimba. And that's really what it says later on in the Psukim. If you look in the next Psukim, V'im lo tarisho Yoshe Aretz, and if you don't get rid of them, you should know. Ayasher totiru me'em l'siki ben you should know they're going to be like thorns in your thorns in, in your eyes. What are thorns? You're alive. You're okay. You're still kicking. You're still moving. It just really hurts. Every time, ow! Ow! Stop! Okay, I'll try to get rid of Okay, we'll get rid of this thorn. Oh, there's another one. That's how it is. And it's going to be uncomfortable on your sides. And they're going to be on a constant disturbance, constantly, uh, constantly on your on your on your tail. What I expected to do to them, what I wanted, and my interests were to do to them. I will do for you. We should never hear of such things, but we see. Such a phenomenon. And I want to point out the Orchaim HaKadosh writes over here, this is not talking about the seven nations. That he says, we already know from Yeshua. We already know those. He's just talking about all the nations. Or any time when a person decides to conquer the land, he says, that's what you have to be careful about. This is an incredible, incredible nevuah that we see in our Parsha about the way that it's supposed to be done and you should know. In the time in 48, when they wanted to go ahead and make the war and, and, and take over in Eretz Yisrael, Chazanish and many of the G'dayim, the Briskarab and others of the G'dayim at the time were not so fond of it. They said a lot of Jewish blood is going to be spilt, and we know a lot of Jewish blood here was spilt. Thousands, tens of thousands of Jews were, spilt, were killed. But besides that, and each one, of course, his own world, but each one, even without that, they said, but if you do it, you do it out of self. If you do it, finish the job. We don't do any half jobs. We do it at the same time that we have to go ahead and make sure that they're not around. If you leave them here, you're never going to be able to live here in peace. It's never going to work. Don't do any of this side-by-side, double states, and all these types of funny things that you are interested in doing. It's not going to happen. And here we have it on a constant basis that all of a sudden... The leftists are always trying to return as much land as possible. If you look, last week we spoke about the Oslo Accords. We spoke about all their interests to be able to give back as much land as we can in order to have the double nation in this cute little land to be able to have. And I have always wondered, and it's bothered me, haven't they learned their lesson? Don't they understand what they're doing? There's no, there's no one to talk to. There's no other side. Why do they keep doing it? So this is the Nakud I want to explain. I want to tell you that in the time in 48, the Arabs were told to run away. The leaders said, leave. We don't want you to be in the way during this war time. That's A. And B, we don't want you to be under any Jewish reign. They told them to leave the land. And yes, 150,000 Arabs left at that time period. And they are the, they are the ones who are the DPs that we know that are in, in Jordan and in other places. But they ran to different areas. And many were left. And you know why many were left? Really, uh, all of them would have left. You know why? Because as Ben Gurion writes in his own diaries, he says, I begged them to stay. We told them, stay. We'll live together. We'll be friends. Just stay. Don't run away. Don't worry about it. We'll be okay. Of course, the left aside, that's, what, uh, that's, that's where he's coming from. And these 
<coughs> ideologies have not left us. They're still here to be able to say, why don't we live side by side? And it's always bothered me. I've wanted to know why they do this. Where is it coming from? What's the purpose? And I'm going to tell you the reason why. And that is because we have to realize there's a big difference between the way we think, a religious Jew thinks about this country, and the way they think. And this is a little bit what I'm going to expand about today, but I'll already give you the answer, and from there we'll expand on that idea, is that we know that the war that, is deal that we have against the Arabs is nothing to do with a piece of land. It is not a territorial war. It is an existential war. The war here is about Eretz Israel. It's not a lot about an extra. It's not about an extra few yards. It's not about an extra piece of property. It's not about an extra. How can we go side by side? And as much as it's an existential war, there is no pesharot. There is no truces. There's nowhere in the middle that we can meet because each person knows Eretz Israel is Eretz Israel. Every 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 yard over here is ours. It's been ours. It's always been ours. We're the ones who received it until the air was made up a thousand years ago that suddenly became theirs by some guy who decided to make up a nice story. But I'll put him, when that's the war, there is no side by side. Why can't the leftists understand that? Because Eretz Israel is everything about territory. It's nothing to do with some existential principle. It has to do with a little bit more territory here and this. The same machoket could have been if we lived in North Africa and we were fighting with some Africans to be able to figure out who's going to live by who, side by side. That's why they have no problem giving away land and no problem giving away the Kotel, giving the Western Wall away. Because as long as we have the pubs that we want to keep in Tel Aviv, as long as we have the beaches that we have in Yaffa, we're good to go. So you have a little bit of this, you have a little bit of, okay, take the old city, what's a, this? It's a tight old place anyways, there's nowhere to walk over there anyways. A few stores, what is that? A funny wall with some grass growing out of it, what am I going to do with the place? But it's not just the idea of religion. It's not just that idea, it's an idea that they can't understand this concept of an idea that's a place because of the essence place, because of the essence of the place itself. It's something that we believe in for the thing itself. And that's why we are very into, and the rightists, and that's why the religious are always on the right side. We believe in understanding that we're here in Eretz Israel to stay, and we're here for all or nothing. There's no 50-50s over here, because there's nothing to do with 50-50. We're here for the land because this is our land. It's always been our land. It's been for the past 2,000 years our land. Just because you had a few thousand Arabs living here, it didn't make it not. But, like I said, when you don't come from a perspective of Torah, when you don't come from such a perspective, you can't. When we understand this idea, we start understanding such incredible things about what Eretz Yisrael is all about, and whether we should be making the move to Bechal come here. Should we be making it here or not? Rav Schwab writes in the end of uh, Parsha Shmot, he writes, when he's talking about Eretz Yisrael, that it's all about Tochelet, which is what we call a yearning, a relentless desire to be here. And if you look in the Parsha, all the time, the people are just begging for a little bit more space here. Now, the truth is, nowadays, we also beg for space here. Everybody's, you know, trying to dig in a little bit of a hole here, a little bit of a hole here to get an extra meter. But over there, as we all know, the daughters of Tzlavchad, they said, we have no problem that someone else should get it, but if our family's not going to get it, why should we give up a piece in the Eretz HaKadosh? We also want a piece of the Kedusha. And Rosh Baruch Hu gave them a tremendous praise. A whole Parsha was written because of the incredible people it was that they were. And say for Yeshua, you find over and over again how many Shvatim were begging to get a little bit more land just because they wanted the essence of the land. It wasn't extra property. It wasn't as expensive as it was nowadays. That wasn't the problem. It was just the idea. Zvulin, Dan, Menashe all going and conquering extra land in order to have a little bit more of Eretz Israel as a savory taste. When you have something sweet, you just want a little bit more of it. Please, oh, so much fun. I love it. I'm so much enjoying it. It's a tasty desire that we have in order to just get a little bit more. And we also have in our Parsha, what do we have, of course, the B'nai God and B'nai Reuven. A very funny thing happens when B'nai God and B'nai Reuven complain. Not complain, when they come and they say, that we just want to be able to stay over here on the other side of the Yarden, on the other side of the, of, of the land, in Sichon and Og, in the area, which is a very large area. Moshe Rabbeinu, who is a very calm and, and, and put-together person, screams at them. He gets furious at them. He says, what are you guys doing? You're like the Miraglim. You guys are causing so much havoc. He didn't even hear their plight. After when he heard their plight, he understood where they're coming from. And he, you, truth is, he understood before also. But he still knew what he was doing. He screamed at them for a reason. Because he says, when a person wants something, you'll settle with anything 
even a little bit just to be able to get there. You'll beg to be there because that's all you care about. If a person, if you understood the beauty of Eretz Yisrael, the Eretz of Atchalav Shabal, you wouldn't be asking for this land. Even though you plan on going in 14 years, you're going to help us conquer, you're not worried about any big people, you're not like the Miraglim, you're scared of anything, you have no problem. But don't you have a lust? Don't you have a desire? Don't you have a... Uh, just like an intrigue to be able to get a certain yearning to be able to get as close as you can to the, to the Eretz HaKodesh of course Moshe Rabbeinu got upset Moshe Rabbeinu was begging commit 515 tefillahs just let me step in the land I just want to be there for 5 minutes he was yearning and he had such a desire to be there and here B'nai Gad and Ruben received a present you're going to get to go into the land and you said no you know that little spoiled kid that gets everything and then he just he, he's not interested he throws it back in your face and you go oh when I was a kid I should be able to have such things. That's why he was so upset, Moshe Rabbeinu, for a just reason. He said the yearning, the lacking is not there. The passion, where's the passion? And it bothered him oh so much. And this is the beauty of Eretz Israel, and this is the beauty of being here, when a person's here, and yes, it's not so easy. It comes with a little bit of difficulties, unfortunately. And we know that's the way it is, but we see all the time over and over again that that was the desire of every one of our previous generations. And it was 5,000 times harder than it is nowadays. The Peat Shulchan, who is a Talmud, he is a student of the Vilna Gon, writes about the Vilna Gon. As we all know, the Vilna Gon never left the base Midrash. He only left twice. One, one time was inquisitive. People are not 100% sure why he left. And he said one time everybody knew. The Vilna Gon wrote his famous letter to his family, to his wife and his children. And he set sail to Eretz Yisrael 250 years ago. We all know what that means. That means going by horse, going by foot. There's not even, not even, not even I'm going to take it. It's a long trip for a man who didn't waste one second, not one minute, one second of his life. A man who learned 22 hours a day, literally 22 out of 24 hours a day. And here he is going ahead and taking a perilous trip to a dangerous country. Why? Because of the affinity of Eretz Yisrael. Because he knows that there's a mitzvah to be there and he wanted to spend those last days there. As the villain, as the Peta Shulchan over there writes, nobody knows why he never make it. He ended up coming back. He wasn't able to make it. The trip did not succeed. He had to abort the trip. We don't know why says the Peat HaShulchan, and he wouldn't tell us. We tried so hard to get it out of us, and we never found out the reason why. But that's the beauty of these people who wanted to do it. The Ramban. The Ramban actually wrote his Igeret Ramban when he was ready to go on his trip to Israel, and he made it. The last two or three years of his life, he was here, I think, two between two to three years of his life, he ended up being able to, he died here in Israel without a family, without his children. He ended up leaving everybody because he knew as they say, he practiced what he preaches. He was a person who gave the drashot about it. He's the one who wrote about the importance of living here over and over again in the mitzvah. And he went as much as he could in order to be able to, to keep to his word, in order to be able to keep to what, uh, what he was doing. Let me quote to you from Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach. This is brought in Halichut Shlomo and Reisha in Zion. Over there, they say Rav Shlomo Zalman used to always speak, even though he was more or less raised here. He, came, he grew up in Eretz Israel, almost the Gamre. They always spoke about his Ishtokekut, his love and his thirst and his desire for Eretz Israel and always to be here. He had a grandson that had a bar mitzvah and had a simcha in Chutzaretz, and he told them, I apologize, I would love to go, and they really wanted their grandfather to go, the great beloved the greatest of the Gedolim, or Shomu Zalman, to be able to come, and he said, I can't go, I can't leave Eretz Yisrael, he made a cheshbon and nefesh, and he said, I can't leave Eretz Yisrael, it wasn't, it wasn't enough of a reason to be able to go. The Shomu Zalman Paskin were during the nine days now, that he said, really it's better for people not to take airplane trips during the nine days, which is a time of danger. And even though he says airplane trips have become commonplace, and we know it's no more than, um, than sort of speak of driving in a car, he says, Lamai, so you make a gomel, after you take a plane trip, you make a gomel, so he was against plane trips. However, when a bakr asked if he should fly from Chutzlar to Eretz Israel during the nine days, he said, yes, definitely. He said, if you're going to come to Eretz Israel, it's a big mitzvah, and that's worth taking the chance. That's something that you should, um, that you should do. And over there, the, that Bachar was not even coming to live here. He was only coming to stay for a month or whatever it was. He was even coming to stay for a temporary amount of time. <coughs> even though there's a sheet on the Pitchei Tshuva that says if you come to Israel and leave for a temporary time, you're not being Mekayim in the Mitzvah of Yishuv Eretzel. You have to come to live. There's a sheet like that. It's a Machloket. If you're Mekayim in the Mitzvah of Yishuv Eretzel just by coming temporarily, but still, 
even though, even though said the Rosh Hashanah to that person, Mikol Makom, in any case, Kol Shehiya, the Eretz Yisrael, Harezim Ashubach, any little mount that you can come ahead, come around and get here, to be able to come, Harezim Ashubach. That's a great thing to do. He also brings over there from the Chaya Adam, that says that the best way place to dive in is only in Eretz Yisrael. When you're here, all the tefillahs are answered, as we'll explain soon. Why? Because there's no intermediary. You're straight with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Rav Falaji, the great Rav Falaji, who lived, the great Sephardi uh, Posek from 200 years ago, in his Arzot HaChaim says, the, when, the, when the Mishnah says, Cherv al a person who learns by himself, it's not a good thing, and it's considered a negative thing. A person should always learn with a Chavrusa, because you can't gain Chochmah without learning without a, without a Chavruta. But still, what does he say over there? He says, but if you're in Eretz Yisrael, there's no Cherv, there's no sword. It's Pesed Gomor. You can learn by yourself. You know why? Says the Gemara in Ketuvot, Avir de Eretz Yisrael Machim. Over here is where the, the Gemara in Baba Batra. Because over here, there's a tremendous amount of chokhmah that rains down on a person when he comes, when he comes to do, when he comes to learn in this beautiful land. Says Rishul Mozaman over there also, someone one time came to ask him a question. He told him, look, Rishul Mozaman, I want to come, but it's not easy, it's very difficult to live here, and I don't know financially I'm going to be able to make it. Questions I hear, day and night. Financially, it's not going to be simple. Should I still make the sacrifice to make the move? So he answered him, you know what? Right before Yeshua came into the land, he killed Melech Cheshbon. He killed the, the king of Cheshbon, a place named Cheshbon. Cheshbon means calculations. He said, when a person comes to Eretz Yisrael, you have to kill all the calculations. Don't make Cheshbonot, he says. Don't make calculations. Just come and do what needs to be done. There's nowhere else to do it. If you're coming, he says, this is the place to be. It's a Tzivu Yashem. It's a, you're surrounded by Kaddish Baruch Hu, you have a direct relationship with him, and there's nothing better. Incredible. Listen to the words of the Kuzari. Now the Kuzari, of course we know, was the Melech HaKuzari. There was a king who was converting, and he spoke to all the different religions. And of course he spoke to the Chaver, the Talmud Chacham. And the, the Chaver answered every question that he had. The hardest question that he answered, and he did not have an answer for you, you know, is when he spoke about Eretz Yisrael. He said, if you're so crazy about Eretz Yisrael, then why don't you move? And he said, Nitzchuni, you beat me, you're right, 100%. You should know the Kuzari is in the tests over here in Eretz Yisrael because of that line. Because he acknowledged the fact that, yes, I should be sitting in Eretz Yisrael, and, and he won, and you're right. That's why he ended up coming to Eretz Yisrael afterwards. But over there, the Kuzari writes that when he asks him about why you guys care so much about Eretz Yisrael, he says, because a person who's in Eretz Yisrael is Lifre Hashem. He's standing directly connected with his Creator, without any types of intermediaries. HaKadosh Baruch is here from the beginning to the end. Hashem is always looking at Eretz Yisrael. Hashem is always looking at Eretz Yisrael. What does it mean he's always looking at Eretz Yisrael? Just like the whole entire country, the whole entire world, world is looking at Eretz Yisrael. Everybody's eyes is always on Eretz Yisrael. It's incredible. Because Hashem's eyes is always here. Hashem focuses on us, and therefore automatically everybody else is looking at us. He cares about us. And he brings many places where it's lived in Hashem. Yonah Hanavi didn't want Nevuah. He was trying to get rid of prophecy. He didn't want to, he didn't want to put Bnei Yisrael in trouble. How did he, get, how did he try to get rid of, of prophecy? So it says in the Pasuk, Vayakam, Vayakam Yonah, Yonah got up, Livroch Tarshisha, to run to Tarshish, Milifnei Hashem, for running away from Hashem. How does it from Hashem? Say Chazal, that means to run away from Eretz Yisrael. If I'm not in Eretz Yisrael, I can't get prophecy. Prophecy only comes when you have a direct connection with the Kurdish Baruch Hu. Also Cain, when he was punished after he killed his brother, it says, Vayetza Cain, Milifnei Hashem. What's that? He had to leave Eretz Yisrael. He had to leave the land of, of, of opportunity, the land of connection, the land of relationship with the Kurdish Baruch Hu. Because every other country has an intermediary. Of course, the Kodesh Baruch Hu is everywhere. Obviously, there's not the question. But you're always going through an intermediary. There's always a blockade. There's something always, you know, as they say, clogging up the clogging up the path. But here in Eretz Yisrael, it's direct. The relationship is direct. You're right there, and that's how. The Ramban and the Drush Torah and Drush Dalit and the Ramban in many places explain the most cryptic statement that's probably written in almost any Gemara. As Gemara says in the end of Ketuvot, it says, Kol Adar B'chutz Laaretz, whoever lives in Chutz Laaretz, Kemi Yitzhah Elon Luka, it's as if he doesn't, he's a godless man. What are you saying? You live in Chutz Laaretz because I live in the United States? Because I live in Great Britain, so suddenly I'm godless? you got to be kidding. How could it be? 
I understand why. I mean, there's a pretty bad over there, but still, I'm kidding. To say such an expression, to be able to do, I'm staying. I'll, I'll go I'll move to Lakewood. Leave me alone. And the Gemara Darshan said from the Pesach, How do I become you for God when you go to Canaan? When you move to Eretz Israel, suddenly there I will become your God. So say both the Ran and the uh, Ramban, and the truth is it's in many of the Mepharshim, such as the Sforno, the Rabbeinu Bechayi, and others. They say this Pshat, that you want a direct relationship with Hashem, you have an opportunity, you have an opportunity to hang out with one of the G'dayim. When you come to Eretz Yisrael, someone offers you an audience with Rav Chaim Kanievsky, with Rav Yosha, with Rav Avadji Yosef. You're not going to take it, you're going to say, listen, I'm busy, i got to go catch a falafel. I'm busy right now, sorry, i got to go out with my kids, we're going to the Kinneret for a nice swim, we're going out to the beaches, I can't, I'll, we'll, I'll try to make it up, we'll take a rain check. Are you joking? Are you crazy? You have an opportunity to have an audience with one of the G'dole Adore and you're going you're gonna to leave it over? Of course, that's the idea over here also. That if a person has the opportunity to be, have this closeness, this relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, he has an opportunity that he forfeits to have such a connection, to be able to do it. So then, of course, <coughs> that's called a person who's Eino Eloka. You're going through a mediator instead of having a direct audience with a Kodesh Baruch Hu, to be able to build that direct, uh, that direct relationship. The Vilna Gon and the Deret Eliyahu and other Makarot, they all come out with this idea. And I'm going to finish with what it means to be Lifnei Hashem. Again, the Kuzari expresses that the idea here that we're saying is you're Lifnei Hashem. When you're in Eretz Yisrael, you're in front of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. It sounds figurative. It sounds exciting. It sounds, you know, it even sounds authentic. But it's a little bit abstract. In Kol Kavod, I appreciate the idea, but what does it mean, Lifnei Hashem? I'm with Hashem. Here I am sitting in Ramat Pei Chamesh. Beautiful. Listen to those birds chirping. Listen, look at, look at the growing things behind me. I feel like Lifnei Hashem. Uh, and in Switzerland, not. I moved to Switzerland. Go up in the mountain in the Alps over there, you can feel Lifnei Hashem. But I'm going to tell you what the Pshat is. And this is based on the uh, Pasuk at Ekev. And with this, we're going to finish this idea. And that is that, yes, it says, It says, Mitzrayim is, gets, you get fed from Lamata. You get, you always are, you're always, uh, you're always getting fed beautiful. You're always getting water from the thing that never ends. As opposed to the Eretz of Atchalav Udrash. Here we have, we live in a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And at the same time, we know what the Mepharshim tell us. The, based on the Pasuk, the Pasuk says it's an Eretz Harim Ubkaot, it says in Parshat Zekev. It's a, it's a land full of mountains, and it's a land full of valleys, and it's a land that's not so easy to travel. And, and even every time they build a building here, there's a lot of breaking that needs to be done. It's made of rocks. It's, made, it's, 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 it's not an easy place to, to break down. And it's also Ramatar Shamayim Tishtamayim. You're only going to drink from the skies. Not always are you going to be satisfied here. The Parnasa here is difficult. Things the living here is not easy. It's not a piece of cake. Why is it so hard? Why? Why can't it just be easy? Why does that have to be the Eretz of Atchalavit? It's almost a contradiction. You're telling me it's so good and then you're telling me it's so hard. The Pusik itself says it's hard to live here. The Pusik itself says it's a, it's a rocky land. It's a place with no Parnasa. It's a place that you have to go ahead and work hard to be able to get somewhere. So you know what the Mepharshim answer all the Mepharshim and Nusik Kalim over there? You know what they say? They say that there's two, and I'm it's expanding obviously, there's two different types of relationships. You know there's those people sometimes they say we have good Shalom Bait, and they say, oh great, I'm so happy I have good Shalom Bait. And when you check into it, the reason why they have good Shalom Bait is because they have nothing to do with each other. They go, one, one is there, one, one works, you know, he works his 12-hour job, maybe even learns a Seder, he goes out and learns a Seder, and they see each other in a passing glance here and there, they don't really want so much to do with each other, they don't want to have so much to do with each other. A little, uh, pass a few words during a, a supper that they have together here and there, maybe on Shabbat they catch a, catch a couple words with each other, but the two no, nomads walking besides each other, great Shalom Bayit. A real relationship is dynamic. There's ups and downs. There's a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. There's things that, you know, always uh, go back and forth. It's an active relationship and not a passive relationship. That's the difference between people who are living in Chutz Arts. Things are relaxed. Things are okay. You know, Baruch Hashem, the Parnassah comes in. Things are okay. But over here, there is no more busy country than this country. There is always something to listen to on the news. It's a hard not to listen to the news. When I was in America, I never once listened to the news. Who cares? There was nothing to do. Because you saw one little, one more criminal robbed a bank in the middle of Utah. Come on, who cares? A, a, a car chase over here, over there. Over here, you're living 
in, in action. Every day is busy. Sometimes it's a good day, sometimes it's a bad day. Sometimes we lose one, sometimes we get one. There's an, it's a constant active relationship. And it comes from difficulty, but that difficulty makes us grow. That's the place where we grow. Rav Huttner spoke lovingly of Israel. In the, end of the, in the end of his days, he actually came here. And you know what he writes in one of his letters? You know what he writes? He said when he was here earlier, he didn't come. And he says the reason why he didn't come, says Rav Huttner, is because Eretz Yisrael is nikne be Yisurim. It's bought with difficulty. And when I was here in the beginning, I didn't have any Yisurim. It didn't hurt. It was pretty easy. So he says these words, Simenu shehayitibo. It's a simen I was in the land. Yeshavti boy. I, 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 was, I was sitting in the land. Rahiti oto. And I saw the sights of the land. Avaloi kaniti oto. But I didn't reclaim it. I didn't own it. I didn't make it a piece of myself. So I figured this is the wrong time to be here. Yeah, to be here in a time when no, maybe when it's not safe, maybe in a time when it looks like it's not safe, but Hashem is protecting us. It's safer here than the Chutz I know there's anti-Semitism there, but it's mild, come on, compared to the missiles flying around here and the miracles that we're living with, but that's it. With all what sounds so dangerous here, we're being protected. Hashem is watching us on a constant basis. Do you realize last week there was a missile that hit in a place in the north, Mujawa, I think something like that is the place, and it killed 13 young kids from the ages of 9 to 13 years old. Rahman al Aslan, it's not it's not a good thing. Over 50 people were very critically injured. You don't even hear about the injured people, but they were also very critically injured by this one missile. Now I want to tell you something. There have been missiles flying left and right in the north. I don't know how much people in America are keeping up with this. It has been happening on a constant basis. They're going house by house, yeshuv by yeshuv, every, every place that there is, they're going and throwing missiles. It's been raining missiles there like there's no tomorrow. And I don't have to make any comparisons. I wouldn't say this on the news. But you have to know this place and, and there has been barely, I don't need to protect people with satan. I hate saying certain things. The casualties have been very minimal. And I, I, I only say this for the message, not for the Ayinara Chas Shalom. But here it is in land in an Arab Druzy area. We're good people. I have nothing against them. But Lamaisa, they're not Jewish. And landed, the protection dissolved. The, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, look how many people got killed. These are serious missiles. I'll tell you the truth. Every time I hear the news, I hear about missiles falling and say, okay, Baruch Hashem, the missiles didn't do anything. They all say, no casualties, no casualties. Like, yeah, I guess these are, they're cockamamie missiles. I guess they're nothing too exciting. And here it is, one missile landed, and it wreaked havoc. So much collateral damage. Because the protection of a Kaddish Baruch Hu is with Am Yisrael, in Eretz Yisrael. That's just where it is. We're being protected here. And again, I, I, I'd be so careful to always be careful of Ayin Ara, but I just, the messages I need to point out. We had a massive calamity that happened seven months ago, in October 7th, in Simchat Torah. 1,200 people were killed. But listen to the statistics. 3,000 Meshugayim, 3,000 animalistic people that were insane, nothing less than insane, who also took pills. These people were worse than lions, absolute machinists. And worse than that, they had machine guns. Machine guns are relentless. And they killed 1,200 people. You know how many? There were 3,000 Arabs that made it over. 3,000, they killed a third of themselves. It doesn't even make sense. If each one put one bullet, lo aleinu, lo aleinu, lo aleinu. In a person, you get 3,000 people, at least 3,000. It's, it's a crazy thing. 1,200 people for five hours, free reign, till the army came in, and there were, that's what happened? 60 ballistic missiles that came from different types of missiles. The statisticians, professors, I saw it myself, said that it is almost impossible statistically that only 1% landed. It doesn't make any sense because it came from many different facets. It came from many different countries that helped. And, it, and, and, only, and, the, and these protection devices are 90%, if not less, that are able to, to protect, that are able to do this, to keep hot bars and everything. Kodesh Baruch Hu is here, Mirei Shoshana, Me'ach Rita Shana. Kodesh Baruch Hu is watching us. Kodesh Baruch Hu is taking care of us. And Chas Shalom, I don't mean to protect Pila Satan. Chas Shalom, that wasn't my intention at all. I'm just trying to point out a thing. Kodesh Baruch Hu gave us a land. 
It's our land, and it's a beautiful land, and that's why we're here. And when people have Sveikot, whether to come or not, and everybody has a Cheshbonot, you have to ask your Rav, obviously. I'm not here, I'm not the uh, Zionist of the year award here. That's not my intention. I'm just trying to point out what our Parsh is telling us. When we're crying about a Chorv Beit HaMikdash, it's coming to scream to us, maybe it's time to rebuild that Beit HaMikdash. You know what the Chazam Sofer says, and with this I'll finish? Rachel Nevake al We always understand Rachel cries on her children. You know why? Because she wants that Mashiach should come. She's crying, Hashem, bring Mashiach back. You want to hear a prediction of the Chatam Sofer? You know what he says it means? Rachel is crying that Klai Yisrael should come back to B'nai Yisrael, to, uh, to Eretz Yisrael. Rachel is crying that everyone should come back to Eretz Yisrael and then Mashiach will come. She wants Mashiach to come and, and she's crying that we should come back in order that that should herald in the calling of Mashiach, that Mashiach should come be Mirabi Amenu, that we should all come to our land in the peaceful land, the land of Shalom the Emet, and we should be able to see the Yeshua Tashem, Keheref Ayn Dezat Hashem, and the destruction of all our enemies, Bekarov, Bimrabi Amenu. Amen.